Welcome to another episode of 22 at the Lips. I'm your host, Alexis Hardwick. Like every episode. Um, so today, I'm just going to jump right in. I have someone who's very near and dear to my heart. We have a pretty extensive little history together. Um, I have with me Robert Martin. He was the pastor of the church I went to growing up. Eons and eons ago. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> At least five years, yeah. <laughs> but, um, he's a he's a good man. Has a good heart. Is the master of all things puns. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to hold off on the punishment today, best I can. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he's a great guy. I. So I normally kind of focus on first responders and having people on the healthcare industry, but I wanted to take it in a different route today. I I wanted to take it in the route of somebody who has been in the perspective of the patient slash the patient's family. Because like we had talked about, we have our calls where we go, we talk to the patient. Sometimes the family is a little... Um, to gently put it overbearing um and then we take the patient and we go and sometimes we never get to we never talk to the family after we never get like that initial onset of xyz from the beginning in the moment raw effect we just kind of get there in the events unfolding so i want to have robert on to talk about a very big day um that happened for his son but before we get there robert martin if you want to tell the people who you are <laughs> what you stand for i am alexis's friend <laughs> and uh anyway i had, to, had the privilege of pastoring her for so many years i've known her basically her whole life i've taught school um school teacher i have a master's in history so i taught school pastored i was head of school for two and a half years Actually, I was ahead of school when this particular episode happened. So I've done things like that. I'm in the ministry now. I'm actually travel evangelizing full time now. So that's just a nutshell. Very brief little outline yeah. besides all the other things you've done. But but uh, yeah, that's about it. So the, the particular incident you were speaking of, my son was 16 years old, Noah, and uh, my middle child. Played basketball for uh, Central Private. He was a starter on the varsity team. We were playing at Southern Lab. It's a district game. And uh, Southern Lab beating us pretty badly, as they typically do. You know, I always say our, our guys played below the rim. There's played above the rim. But Central Private, and I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason, but Central Private is pr primarily white. Southern Lab predominantly black. And uh, that plays into the story. So we get there for the game. I, I drive Noah to the game. Everything's fine. We're talking about what we're going to do after the game. We're going to eat, all those things. And at halftime of the game, I'm sitting in the bleacher with a few fans from our school. And most of the fans, of course, Southern Lab. And uh, they're rejoicing in our demise, of course, <laughs> at halftime. And so I'm sitting in the bleacher. And by the other parents, and a, a student comes from the locker room to the foot of this uh, bleachers. And I thought he said, Noah needs water. So I said, okay, I'll get him some water. He said, no, he's having seizures. So the first thing I think of is when he was a small child, he had some seizures. And I'm thinking we're going to get back into medication or whatnot, all that those type things. So I jump up and I run toward the locker room. When the bleachers with me, close uh, to my left, there's a doctor whose son played on the team, uh, Dr. Kyle Dean. So his son played on the same team. And so when I went running, I, I don't know if the kid told him or not, but he came after me. So I run into the locker room and Noah's on the on the slab, on the on the concrete slab, and he was just kind of moving a little. And the doctor came in. I went to Noah. And um, so the doctor comes and looks at him. And then he speaks to the, the coach. And the coach says, tells us what happened. Said we were standing up, getting ready to go in the second half. 
and uh, he was drawing up some play for him as if that would help. But anyway, he said, working on some play. And uh, he said Noah uh, collapsed, and the team caught him and laid him down, and he started seizing. And um, so he's telling us that story, and that's not the most important part of it, because what happens is, uh, unbeknownst to us, he goes into cardiac arrest. He has a heart attack. So the because the doctor says as the team's leaving, the doctor says to me, you know, let's lay him over on his back and let him rest because when you come out of a seizure, you go limp. And he thought that's what what had had happened, but in actuality, the seizure led on into a, a heart attack. And uh, so I, I I remember putting my hand on his chest to move him over, and I didn't feel any movement and I looked in his face he had turned like an ashen gray color so I asked the doctor I said is he breathing and Dr. Dean checked him immediately he said he's not breathing he, so he started CPR he told me to call 911 so I ran out onto the edge of the court called 911 and I cried out to the people there can anybody help us you know my son needs help if anybody can help us and um so I go back in, Dr. Dean's working, doing CPR, uh, frantically working on my son. And uh, it's, it's all surreal to me. It's like this, this can't be happening. You know, we were just laughing and talking about our plans a little while ago. And this, this just can't be real. And it was so, of course, as a minister, I, I, I tried to pray. I had a hard time praying because I was just kind of phased out. And, uh, uh, so that that was difficult. I remember kneeling down by him, putting my hands on him, and watching the doctor work. He's sweating and he's working hard, you know. And I could tell, you know, it, it was a serious situation. And uh, so then a gentleman comes in from Southern Lab. I think it was actually their security officer. He came in, took his jacket off, and he starts helping the doctor. And then shortly thereafter, there's a nurse who came in who actually went to this. Her daughter played on the, the girls' team, uh, Melissa O'Neill. So she came in and she started helping. So I had a doctor, nurse, this officer working. And then another gentleman comes in for a few minutes and helps. And he goes, he was from Southern Lab and he leaves. And in a few minutes, he comes back with an AED the, the device. So they remove his shirt or cut his shirt. I think they cut his shirt and then uh, hook hook all that up on Noah and tell me to move my hand. Of course, I move my hand and they shock him and I see him, you know, convulse. And, and at that point, they basically took me out. They the, the, Some men dragged me out to the corner of the gym and then I'm trying to get back in, but they won't let me in. So it's very frantic harrowing experience at this time and uh i see people coming in and out and and uh there, there appears no there's no uh, anticipation of hope in anybody's face you know it's all it looks very gloom and doom you know so anyway i try to go back in they won't let me back in and so i come to come to find out after the process was over they told me that they had shot him three times with ad to get his pulse back and then uh, uh while, a little side note while i'm in in the gym the head coach for southern lab actually comes over and, and he stands with me and he starts praying and and then several of the women from their school actually come down in that corner and they start having a little prayer meeting, which was pretty interesting, which shows you, you know, it doesn't matter what school it is or or, or color, ethnicity or background. None of that matters when you're facing a situation like that. Right. You know what I'm saying? You know, they, they were rejoicing at beating us so bad earlier, but now here they are, you know, praying for my boy. So I, I have great admiration for Southern Lab to this day because they of how they treated uh, my son. I remember one particular lady from there in that group and she was trying to get my attention and she said, look at me, look at me. Of course, again, I'm a pastor. You know, I 
but I was having a hard time in that moment. I, you know, just I don't know how to explain it. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But so she gri- finally grabbed me by like this, and she said, "Look at me, look at me, look at me." <laughs> and she grabbed me. She did that. And she looked in my eyes, and she said, "Our God is a miracle working God." You know, she said that. So they they were they were praying inside. They were working. And I think all of it works together myself, obviously. But so they're they're working, and finally, uh, I see the uh, stretcher going out as they they've come and loaded him up, uh, and uh, to take him out. And the doctor sees me and he tells me to come. So I get I go with him into the ambulance. So it's me and the doctor and Noah. Noah is. Uh, He's doesn't have control of his of his hands, his leg. He can't talk. Just a guttural sound every once in a while. Just bleh, you can't he can't talk. And so the doctor they're they're trying to end the ambulance. They're trying to get control of him to sedate him and whatever they won't need to do. But he wasn't cooperative, so it was difficult for him. Mm-hmm. And uh, the doctor told me, Doctor Dean, he said, you know, it's very serious, Mister Martin. Uh, he said, I've seen you know some of this before. It's a very serious situation. He said he wasn't breathing on his own or his heart wasn't beating on his own for at least 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. They were working on him. And then that's when he told me they had to shock him three times just to get him back. And uh, so uh, we get to the emergency room and uh, uh, they unload him and there's people waiting there. And they finally get him sedated and all of those things. And um, so I remember the cardiologist, when he came in, he checked Noah and he checked everything out, the chart. He talked to the EMS, EMS people, got all their information and all of those things. And then he told my wife and I, he, he, he told us, he said, I, I just want to tell you, I don't think he's going to make it. And if if, if he does, uh, he's probably going to have some, you know, brain malfunction and maybe problems with his limbs or whatnot. But so it's very, um, that was a very terrible thing to hear, obviously. So of course we were praying and, and the EMS people stayed there for a while, helped with the doctor, whatever, all that. So first I want to say, as far as what you guys do, I mean, it's, it's life or death. You know I mean? The, it's uh you never expect a, a event like that to happen. And the joy, well, semi-joy of a basketball game. And so you're there doing normal things and you never know. And out of out of left field, here it comes, and you you don't expect it. And it's and to to a parent, to me, it was just it was just surreal. I was just I, I was just like it's like I wasn't it's was like an out-of-body experience almost. It's like, you know, this this can't be real. Somebody, you know, somebody wake me up and somebody And of course, I'm begging, you know, God, take me, let him live and all of those things. So in a situation like that, obviously, you need somebody who's knowledgeable, who knows what to do, because we don't know. And uh, and not only that, if we did know, might be caught up in the emotion of the moment, not be able to do anything, you know what I'm saying? So so I I don't have enough praise for 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 what y'all do because uh it helps save my son obviously and then also again having a, a doctor who happened to be there a nurse happened to be there all of those things were um uh wonderful to have obviously and uh so i credit all that of course god too but i credit what man did man and woman did in that situation for my son still being alive today It was a big event because, I mean, for you, like, that's your son. But, like, from our perspective, you get you get dispatched to a basketball game for this kid who went to cardiac arrest. And that's, like, that's big for us to, like, obviously, I, I don't know the perspective of a dad. I'm not a dad. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to figure that. But, um. And it's kind of like we talked about earlier, like we get called in the cusp of it. So being there 
from the get-go and having to see that happen to someone you love. And I, I've told this to my family, my friends. As much as I'm able to do this job, I think decently. I haven't got fired yet. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so as much as I'm able to do my job, in that state of shock and just that surrealism you're talking about, it would be so hard to treat somebody because it it takes it from like, say you saw that to somebody on the street, they just collapsed, went to cardiac arrest. There's kind of that disconnect a little bit, but whenever it comes to somebody you know, yeah, it takes it to a different level. Um, and something I want to point out is you had talked about they shocked them with the AED um, like three times, three yeah. times. I mean, there are, there's the credit to God. There's the credit to having, I don't want to say the perfect storm, but the perfect storm of the doctor and nurse that was there and everybody that was able to do chest compressions and all that stuff. But having the AED there, if you don't have an AED yeah. in a public setting, one, I don't think you're up to regulations. But number two, and this is what they teach us, is that that, that early um, early defibrillation is what saves people. It's yeah. not the drugs. I mean, sometimes it is the drugs we punish. It is the chest compressions, which is very important, all that stuff. But there's only so much we can do without having that electrical simulation, stimulation right. of the heart. Um, Look, if I, if I could tell you something about the AED, that's pretty amazing. Uh, of course, now uh, we'll go somewhere on vacation. It doesn't matter if it's Grand Canyon or Christmas time. You got this forty foot Christmas decorated Christmas tree, and I tell Noah, I said, "Here, okay, stand over here, let's get a picture." And he'll go find the AED and stand by. I said, "In the wall." I said, "I want to get a picture about that." <laughs> <laughs> So, so I have pictures of him with a, you know, say about 80. <laughs> <laughs> She's a funny kid, but uh, so the, the, the AED is so true. So we we did not know he had a condition. Uh, he, he's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, thick and large heart. Didn't know he had it. And the, the cardiologist said he's, you know, he's, he's born with it. He's had it. He could have had an episode at any point. And he said, typically, he said the condition is 95% fatal because when you have an episode, there's nobody there to help you. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, you, you, it could be in the bed. It could be sitting. You don't even have to be exerting yourself. It could be, it's just there. It's like a ticking time bomb waiting to have that one episode that takes you out. So it could happen to my son when he's practicing. It could happen at home. It could happen at any place. We were blessed and fortunate that when it did happen, it happened in a place mm -hmm. where a doctor was there, a nurse was there, and an AED was there. So he told us with that condition that CPR wouldn't have saved him. You had to have the AED. So with his condition, if he didn't have the AED, he would not have lived. And which brings up another interesting story on the on the how wonderful it is what people will do but also i think how god orchestrates things so the school in that gym did not have an aed for a period of time and oh uh, they're they're supposed to have one i don't i don't know exactly i've heard different stories because i heard this stuff afterwards about what happened not sure exactly what happened but anyway they didn't have one so their middle school coach coach augustine and by the way, these are all friends and heroes to me now. Coach Augustine, Dr. Dean, Nurse O'Neill, all these people, you know, they're like top shelf heroes to me. You know, Understandable. of course, the EMS people, I don't know their names, but, you know, but it, all these people who were a part of that the salvation of my son. So anyway, so this coach, middle school coach started raising money to buy an AED for the school. And uh, so he said, I got a picture of me sitting at a table selling, you know, sweet tarts and candy and chips and all this kind of stuff. And so he's, he started this over a year prior to then. And he's raising this money to, to buy an AED. After a few months, he had a certain amount of money. And some people in the athletic department said, 
you got a lot of money. You need to buy some new uniforms for your kids because you know they're all you know old uniforms, and you've got enough money. You need to buy some new uniforms. He said, "No, sir." He said, "I'm raising this money for an AED. We need an AED in this gym." And uh, so he raised the money to buy an AED for the gym. Went and bought it, and brought it to his office the day before this happened. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so I mean, I, I thank God, him, all of them. He puts it in his office. And um, so the next day is when this game is. So he, he doesn't have a game. Matter of fact, he has a meeting in Alexandria. So he gets on the road heading to Alexandria. He gets a call that the meeting's canceled. Turns around, drives back. He says, to, tells his wife before he goes home, he said, I just want to go by the gym and see how um, the varsity team's doing. So he comes in just before halftime. He's standing at the scores table and he hears me when I come out the side and say, can anybody help? I called 911, if you remember, and I said, can anybody help us? He's the one who came in for a few minutes and then left and went and got the AD and came hooked it up to my, on my side. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's an amazing story. So the AED, uh, again, as she said, you, you have you have to have those. Um, just recently, the Louisiana legislature passed a, 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 a law requiring every elementary school, middle school, and high school in the state of Louisiana to have an AED in their gyms or whatever. And... Um, so that just happened two months ago, maybe it was just not a short period of time ago. So Senator Cleo Fields heard about Noah's story and actually got Noah to go to the legislature. So Noah spoke to the Senate. He spoke to the House. Then he spoke to a joint session of both promoting that bill. Yeah. And uh, it was it was by uh, Jumpstart Your Heart. I think they were the ones that were promoting it and Cleo Fields. And uh, so Noah was there dressed up and I got pictures of me. So he's gives his story, you know, the story about the AED and all that. And they pass it. So and uh so now it's a, it's a requirement. Well it's a requirement already. What this law does actually if you can't afford it or you can't get it, the the, the state will make sure they'll pay for one for you. Make sure that every elementary school, middle school, and high school. So as horrific as it was for us, it was used you know, you know, his testimony was used to help to hopefully save other people down the road that right. they'll have an AED and, you know, because we're, we're big AED fanatics. And Understandably. You know, we take pictures with them. <laughs> I've got pictures of all kind of AED. It's a whole folder full of yeah. them. I mean, it's like, yeah, but look at this AED. <laughs> it's a different color. You thought that one, look at this one out. Done on this one, too, That's right. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's an amazing story uh, for us and for Noah. And, and every day I wake up, every day I wake up, I I, I thank God, and uh, I thank uh, God for the people who are trained to help save lives. And uh, so I thank God every day before I go to bed every night. I went. I hugged him this morning before I left. Went in there and said, "Hey, son, I love you." Oh, um, <laughs> man. So anyway, that, that, he was sixteen. That was three and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. So he has now. He has a, a defibrillator in his chest, of course, hooked up, and so he he's he deals with that. What's like the um, before I get into that? Um, when you talk about the AD, um, that's why, like, it is so important. And we tell so many people, and just people just need to know in general, take a CPR class. And if not, I mean, we have the internet at our fingertips. Literally just look up how to do CPR. And that's what they tell you whenever someone calls 911, and someone's in cardiac arrest, they walk you through how to do it. So it's a matter of, CPR training, but also with the AED, 
it is designed for a random bystander. There are pictures on it of where to put the pads on the chest. Yeah, you it press, walks you through it all. Yeah, you turn it on, and it literally talks to you in real time. Anyways, so um, I do want to ask. So you said he has the defibrillator now. Um, is there any like? Oh, also, um, so the doctor basically gave you guys what he thought was like news that Noah wasn't going to make it. Mm -hmm. Um. Was there like a long turnaround time? Because for for our perspective, um, especially if, like if I had gotten on scene and heard that he was down for 15 minutes, that's a long time. After a very short window of time, like brain tissue starts dying. Like it, that's a very short window of time. And like I've I've heard about, I've seen Noah's Noah's good. Like I mean, not good, but like he's he's with it. Like it's. Mm -hmm. It's one of those few cases that, one, whenever we get somebody back from cardiac arrest and we bring them to the hospital, whatever, it's one thing if they make it. It's another if those, honestly, for me, like those rare instances where they walk out of the hospital just because we're not there when it happens. And sometimes nobody's there when it happens. So, um as far as like a long term picture, he has the defibrillator. What else is he looking at? And what was the turnaround time of okay. when he was in the hospital? Okay. So uh, that night, the cardiologist told us that that was it's probably about nine o'clock at night now. And uh, I remember in the as after everybody cleared out because the team was there and there was church people there, family, you know, a lot of people there in the lobby and so some of them filtered out, obviously, throughout the night. So I would actually go up to his uh, bed every so often, just lean down, and just say, hey, I love you, Noah. And he wouldn't say anything, just to, like, every once in a while, like the gurgling sound. Which, by the way, I I, I told this story, at a, and uh, there was a cardiologist in the congregation who was over the whole university system. So he he knows about all this stuff. And I didn't know this till just probably a month ago. And he told he told the pastor after this ser service, he said, I want you to know that's a greater miracle than he's even saying it is, because he, from what he's saying is he went to an anoxic brain injury. Mm -hmm. And he said that that gurgling sound is a, is a sound of brain rapid brain deterioration is what the doctor said. He said the truth of the matter is he should have never got up. He should have never, never looked you in the face again. He said he should if he lived he should have been in a vegetative state or whatever that's what that that particular doctor said who was a state cardiologist whatever so anyway back to the story so that's all i hear on occasion and that's nine o'clock so I, I do that every little every little so often about three in the morning i did it i leaned down and i said hey no i love you and he said i love you too so when he said that and i ran down the hospital hall and just, you know, hey, he, he spoke, he spoke, he spoke. And that was three in the morning. And then the next morning, um, he had a friend from school who came to visit. So by noon the next day, that's three in the morning, by noon, he was sitting up in a chair playing video games with his friend. The cardiologist comes in. When the cardiologist comes in, he looks and he's, you tell he's just kind of shocked about it. He looks at him, he looks at, checks the chart and all that. He comes to the back of the room and he tells, he tells my wife and I, he says, he said, I am not a, a religious person. He said, but I will tell you it's a miracle that your son's up doing what he's doing. He said, I've seen this so many times and they either don't make it. If they do make it, they have problems, you know. Noah, Noah went on, he was in the hospital two days and then he went home. And this was when COVID first started, so he had to wait a while to get that uh, defibrillator. So he had to wear this thing around his chest, uh, mm -hmm. like a package. Well, I don't know. He had to wear that for a couple months, I guess. And uh, so he was a junior then, so he graduated as a senior with honors, and he's in his third year at LSU right now. If you were to see him, you would you would not know anything happened to him unless you saw the scar you know he's strong he's vibrant he's funny he's uh 
He does deal with uh, depression on occasion. Like uh, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, he went into AFib and of like a whole day. And so he has a monitor like under his bed. And so they check it so they can see when something's going mm -hmm. awry. And so they contacted us and said, you know, he's, which he told us he wasn't feeling real good. But we found out he was actually in, in AFib. And he, for like two days, he was just, you know, just totally down. So he, that really hurts him. And then he also, again, he has, uh, just with depression when that happens. And then sometimes just thinking about, you know, of course we, he understands it's, it's amazing. He's alive, but sometimes he wonders, you know, can I have a normal life? You know, can I ever get married? You know, I might have friends, you know, all that, but he has all that. He has friends and girls that a lot of girls that like him. Anyway. But anyway, but <laughs> my point, my point is that he, he has, because he's just a great kid. I always tell him, I said, to have such a bad heart, you have a great heart. He's just a great, real, very sensitive, loving type person. So, so he does deal with depression. He, they did put him on some, I guess, blood blood thinner type stuff mm -hmm. to keep, help with the heart, the, the flow of the blood and the stuff. But other than that, that's all he's got. He's got the defibrillator. He takes that every day. And he's just... They basically have told him, said, you know, when you, when you, if you do exercise, we do do certain things. You have to be cognizant of a point of stopping. You have, you have to, re, you have to read your body and know. And basically, you can't, you can't overexert yourself to the point where you can't, like, speak a complete sentence or, or something. Anyway, they gave him some guidelines to go by. So, he's uh Probably the LSU today doing this class stuff today. Should be anyway. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna have to check when I get <laughs> where you at, boy. So anyway, obviously for us, it's you know for the family, we're it's in the back of our minds constantly. You know, he, he gets tired of us asking you know, how you feeling. You know, if, if we don't hear from a while, we call you. Okay, yeah, Dad, I'm playing with my friends, Leo. <laughs> I'm good, Dad. If I'm not good, I'll tell you. Is that, that, well, I don't know about that. That's, that's why we keep asking. You may not be able to tell us. So, so basically, the prognosis is he he can live a, a a long, normal life, and hopefully, if he had another episode, that that would, you know, mm -hmm. be the AED, I guess. Right. So he's got so he's got his own pocket AED carrying around with him. So it has it hasn't happened yet where that has to have have go off, but so that's a little bit of that. And it's it's such a big event in general for anybody, but it's someone that young, like whoa. Yeah, it's um, like why you know, why me, you know, yeah. why and why why am I even here? You know, should I why was I born, you know, uh, born with that condition? Why was I born at all, you know? Yeah. And of course, we try to show them that, you know, as bad as it is, you still have good quality of life. You know, you have people mm -hmm. that love you. You 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 know, he's, except for those points of depression, he's very happy, jovial kid, you know. He doesn't laugh at my dad jokes, but oh. nobody does. So. <laughs> I do sometimes. <laughs> They'll just stare at me like, <laughs> but anyway, but he's, we're thankful every day for him being with us. Um, and that cardiologist had a more than warranted expression with the shock and stuff. Cause like I said, we, we have patients that they go to the hospital and like he said, either they just realistically speaking, either they don't make it or they're vegetables. And when we hear about those stories, like with Noah, like if that crew got that story, like that's one of those for most people, like very few in an in an EMS career stories. 
and to hear yeah, well, I wish I knew who the crew was I don't know I don't know but if, if they're if they're listening you know obviously it, uh we thank God for them yeah. for them being there and helping helping my son he would again he wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for people doing their duty whether it's raising money to buy an AD whether it's driving the ambulance there and you know, the training that you have it's life or death and uh, for a parent with a with a young son, we can't praise you guys enough. You know, you know. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'm driving down the road now. If I see one, I, I, I start praying. You know, whoever it is on the other end of this, you know, help them and give them the strength and courage to help save someone's life, like they saved my son's life. And uh, it's a it's a it's continuously before us. It's always before us. And we're very grateful. Um, so one last little tidbit. Um, so we, especially for pediatrics, but any call in general, um, when it's these high state calls, when it's literally life or death, it's not just Mimo fell in the kitchen and the family's frantic because Mimo is hurting, yeah, but it's like sprained ankle. Hey guys, let's just uh let's take a breath. But <laughs> like, I see, we we get the ones where like the family members running outside and like waving us down. It's the only house in the, like the last corner of the block, and we're like, "Man, I wonder what house it is." <laughs> <laughs> Hope we can find it. That's right. And fire departments are in there. They got their lights. I'm like, "Gosh, golly, I think we're lost." <laughs> yeah. But um. So on like these very harrowing calls, and then especially you add in like, and you treat every call the same in these matters, but like when it's a pediatric, when it's a kid, it hits different. Um, so as far as like any interaction with, um, I know you said the the doctor that was there was explaining it and stuff like that. If he wouldn't have been there or like in this very big hypothetical, ambiguous idea um what is something that you would have wanted at least an attempt of explanation or like something that could have been said or any interaction that could have kind of eased you or anything like that because like we have these calls and like one I recently had was a uh one-year-old having a seizure like I didn't really have time to sit and explain to the mom, like, hey, we've been here like three minutes and we're going to go right now. It was very much this general, like, hey, we're going to do everything we can. We're going to this hospital, follow behind, don't get in a wreck, bye. It's like, we we don't always have those good heart, like, moments where we can really explain what's yeah. going on. So yeah. what what is something that, taking all of this into account, first responders can kind of take into consideration going into these calls, comma, especially pediatric calls like this. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, we want you to do your job. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's number one. It's not so much of trying to make us feel better. You know, what makes us feel better is you're doing your job. So if you're, to me, the way I feel about that, if, if you're intentional and you're doing your job and you're focused on that, I don't want you focused on me. Right. So I'm saying I want you right. focused on my child. Like it, even at, in the gym, I just, just praying. Don't worry about me. Pray for him. He'll do this or go in there and take care of him. Um, so I don't. I don't know that there's anything that can be said. I, I think uh, if anything, to say you know, you know, we we got this and we're gonna we're gonna do everything we can. We're taking care of it. You know, just come meet us there, or whatever. Um, of course, there's going to be you know, franticness about it because it's an emergency. So I, I don't, I don't think they want you know to sit around and drink coffee and talk right, about no, you know, no. <laughs> well, this, hey, you know, we we think we might be able to handle this because <laughs> they want you in the moment. They want you to take you know. I, I wanted, I, I didn't care if they say anything to me at all. To be honest with okay. you, you know, uh, I just want them looking at him, working on him. Everything else is. Right. Insignificant. Yeah. Everything is in, insignificant. So I, I don't, to me, it's just about doing the job. And, um, you know, 
if, if they if they were spent too much time talking to me, I, mm-hmm. that, I'd worry about that. You know, yeah. don't worry about me. Now, again, you know, kindness and saying whatever you can. You know, hey, you know, we we got your child. We know you love your child. We're gonna do everything within our exactly. power. You know, we love you. You know, you love your child. We're gonna do everything we've been trained. We'll do everything within our power. Make sure your child's okay. Me, this at such and such. Yeah, and that's. That, I think that's plenty to say. I don't think. Yeah. You know, there could be too much said. You know, um, and because when you when you hear the other side, like that cardiologist, and we actually had they took him then to New Orleans, transferred him down there. So we had three three cardiologists that checked him. All told us the same thing. Said we don't. We can't explain it. You said the truth is that it is. All we can say it's a miracle. He shouldn't be doing as well as he is if he's even alive. And then they did a couple of uh, TV deals on him. And then the, the newspaper, the advocate, the lady who wrote the article, she wrote, I think, three articles all about it. And uh, she told us, she said, I've been writing 25 years. And she said, I've written several articles about this happening to athletes or whatever and she said this is the first time that i've ever written where the person lived this is the first time i wrote the article where the person lived so you know we count our blessings we we feel badly for those that the story turned out differently which is one reason why we're thankful that noah has been used in in the legislature to help pass that bill stuff like that so hopefully There'll be other Noahs, you know. Mm-hmm. There's a defibrillator there. There's people there. And we just hope there'll be more stories like his where people can make it because of the kindness and the training and the heart of people such as yourself that do whatever you can to help save their lives. So you can't put you can't put a premium on it, you can't put a value on it. You know, you guys don't get paid enough. So yeah, whoever's out there with the money, what y'all know that? So, you know, because you can't put a you can't put a value on life. You can't put a value on that. So, I mean, I would, you know, I would I would go into debt and do or have to, you know, maybe maybe rob a bank or you know whatever whatever <laughs> whatever we had to do to to make sure that there are people like you that can take care of people like us. Mm-hmm. You know, we gotta have it. Right. Um, I I just brought that up because we we get those calls, and especially with kids, that it makes it hard for a little bit because they're the family is so frantic, and sometimes they get in the way that like we have to we have to very abruptly and honestly be like, can yeah, you please take- get out of the way yeah. so we can do our job? Yeah, and that's my catchphrase now yeah. it's like get out the way so i can do my job please yes and i understand that of course you again you understand that the heart of a parent you know i want to do whatever i can mm-hmm. but i think it's it's got to click it's got to click in us that hey this is out of my hand you know mm-hmm. I, I don't i don't have the expertise and they do so so it's basically like i'm releasing i'm, I'm releasing what's most precious to me and put it in your care and it's, it's not real easy to do, right? Because uh, especially if I've never seen you, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And you're in my house, thankfully. But but I'm taking what's most precious to me, and I put it in your hand. But that's where trust comes in. You know that you you've been trained, you've been, and that's that's what we lean on. You know, with with the pilot of an airplane, you know, whatever we trust, we trust you with our lives. And uh, and there's there's no more critical need of trusting you with our lives than when something like that happens. Right. And that's, like I say most episodes, that's why it's so important to take your job seriously, even on like those calls where it's like, man, I don't get paid enough for this. Um, whatever. But like, like you said, um, like y'all experience, like, it was a normal day until. Yeah. And that's that's literally like the aspect of this job is that like 
it can be that call at any given point in your shift, any given point. So if you're not ready for it, like, I mean, you're trained itself, but just always having that sharp mental focus. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you don't, you don't see it coming till it comes, till it happens. Yeah. But think I'm thankful that y'all prepare yourself. Absolutely. And then, and then the, so that the crisis meets your training. And, and you're, you're ready. And then you get, you get these amazing outcome stories like Noah's. And that's. It's got to make it worth it all. Oh, absolutely. You know, when you, when something like that happens. Yeah. Like I, I don't know if you noticed, nobody can see it, but us. Um, I have little tidbits of emails from different yeah, patients that. and stuff like that. Just because so- there, there are some that like, they come in, we have the call or whatever. And then we get that little feedback or follow up, and it it, it just yeah. it it makes a difference. Yeah. It really makes. How, a how precious is that? You know, that's what makes it worth it all, right? If I had if I had outcome like Noah's, I'd I'd blow it up. But on the whole lot. Well, in, 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 at at the house, we have like framed articles you know, that were written about it from the newspaper and all that. We have all that. We have the uh, the jersey that was cut, got that framed in the house. Back not in my room, so everybody don't want to see it. But right. so I remember, I remember them cutting it, and uh, so they actually wadded up through the trash can, and I, I just went, I just reached and grabbed it and kept it, not thinking to frame it, of course. But I just wanted, I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to have it, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, we're very thankful and we're very blessed. And and I hope there'll be a lot more stories like that that you're involved in and that your staff and all you folks will do. I don't know if I want that call, but gosh, golly, I want the outcome. <laughs> but um, so if um, and those are all the basic questions I have. Um, is there anything else? I, I think that about covers it. Again, I want to thank you for uh, your time, allowing me to share the story. And I hope it uh, uh, encouraged someone out there. You, ne- you never know when that's going to be your story. So it, 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 as you know, I'm sure there's a lot of sad stories along the way. And uh, but you you did what you could. That's all you can do. All you can do is do what you can. And And if you if you. If you didn't have what you have, the training and so forth, it wouldn't even be the potential for the miraculous, you know. But because of what you do, there's potential. So I hope there's a lot of great stories down the road of other people like Noah. I hope you have your Noah. I hope other people have their Noahs. And and uh, that will be a great blessing. So stay short, stay focused, stay on top of your game. And if that's all you got, and as I end every single episode, so with that. The 22 at the Lips podcast is designed to support, not replace the relationship that exists between a practitioner and his or her medical director. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host, guest, and not necessarily of Master Medics. The information provided during this podcast is intended for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for your approved protocols.